was anybody else really, really unhappy with the fact that the obnoxious dude did not get killed? I mean, I thought we were going to have to wait the whole movie, you know, near the end of the movie. He's still not dead, and he's not even near the camp that's near the camp. He's still alive, and I thought it was going to be like in the first movie where we had to wait the entire movie before the obnoxious dude got killed. But then, no, nothing happened to him. The dude that saves her at the end, the owner guy, or, you know, their boss, anyway. I don't know, wasn't he the same dude that got knocked down by Jason before, when on the floor? I mean, wouldn't Jason make sure that he was actually dead? I mean, it's not like Jason was in that much of a hurry. Anytime we see him, he's walking casually. Except for that one time where he's rushing off into the bushes, I guess he really had to go or something, when the cop sees him from the car. I personally just love the fact that the cop apparently doesn't see him, you know, way earlier, because he must have been running straight across. I mean, if this is the road, he must have been coming from over here to the bush over here. How did the cop not see him? I mean, did he just come from the bush and then, oh, made changed my mind, you know, ran back? But anyway, he's usually not in a hurry, so wouldn't he make sure that the boss dude was dead before he approached Alice, or whatever her name is? And another case of him moving very slowly, the knife, you know, basically being attached to the POV, and he just slowly walks to the girl who's just standing there screaming. I suppose she's sort of backed into a corner, but really, she could have fought back. She could have done something. You know, I mean, that was pretty ridiculous. That was completely riding on the fact that hopefully the audience was completely, you know, into being scared of Jason at this point. Seeing his face at the very end. It's predictable after the first, but it wasn't bad. It was a reasonable makeup job. It was really obvious that that was going to happen after they unmasked him. I mean, that was more obvious than in the first one. You know, once Mrs. Voorhees is headless, you think, okay, this might actually be it. Maybe it's over now. But then he pops out of the water. And in this one, it's pretty obvious that we're going to get to see that face, you know. But anyway, I guess Jason is avenging his own death by drowning. And he's doing this by not drowning anyone. And by killing people who aren't actually counselors like Crazy Ralph. That's really too bad. I wouldn't have minded seeing more of that dude. I think they should have him go to other cities and just randomly warn people you're going to die. So yes, he's, you know, taking revenge for his own death and for his mother's decapitation. Again, not by actually chopping anyone else's head off. And she was avenging his death. There's a lot of revenge going on in this family. Can't they just turn the other cheek? And... There's again the thing of, you know, if you smoke, or if you do the whole premarital sex thing, you will get killed. I suppose you could see this as a sort of personification of, you know, Jason as a sort of personification of the horrible tragedy that will befall you if you do sin. I like to think that he's just really jealous and sexually frustrated. He's 40 by now. You realize that? I mean, he was like 13 in 1958. It's been 22 years. You know, in 1980, which was the first film, this one takes place five years later. Meaning, he's 40. And the guy has not had any sex. Yeah, I can kind of understand why he's chopping people up who are having sex. That. I think I'd be pretty frustrated too. So we have the head. You know, in the documentary or on the commentary track of the first movie, 
the writer of the first one, Victor Miller, talks about how maybe he would have involved the father somehow, Mr. Voorhees, in the sequels, but he didn't write the sequels, so instead we get the mummified head of Mrs. Pamela Voorhees, and then we get another sort of possession kind of scene with Alice taking forever to actually attack him and making sure to step out of the way so he could see the immobile head back there in its place. Why did it work? Why exactly did he fall for the whole I'm your mother Jason thing? She, she didn't really sound like her. She was nowhere near the same age. Apologies to Miss Betsy Palmer. Don't come and kill me. I don't know. I, I don't quite understand why that worked. The ending was really how the rest of this should have been. I mean, maybe you couldn't have every kill be like that, but you had to have more of them be like that because they really weren't that terrifying at all. And at the end, because he's just attacking this one person, because they saved up all their good ideas for how he could be chasing this one person, he's constantly falling over, being knocked by, back by a door, and he falls you know, several feet backwards, landing on his ass. I mean, I get that he's not, you know, an elegant ballet dancer, but seriously, is he that frickin' fragile that, you know, he'd be knocked that far back by a door opening? I did kind of like her being trapped in the car. That was a good idea, because it's kind of like, okay, do I get out of this car? Do I try to start the car? What do I do? They didn't play it up quite as much as they could have and maybe should have, but they did a decent job with it. But seriously, she's constantly hiding from him, you know, trying to fight back, trying to run away from him. If this had been more what happened in the rest of the film, then the deaths wouldn't have been so sudden and so ineffective. Because when the death is really, really short and really, really sudden, if, you know, you don't have time to get into it. And the fear isn't allowed to build up. What exactly happened when she was hiding in front of the car and he was like, you know, a bit behind, and she leans up, okay, he's still there, and then she runs, and then he isn't there, then, I mean, he doesn't appear to follow her right away. I don't know, that just... whatever. I do love how this uses clips of the first to eat up four or five minutes of the 81 minute running time sense credits and it's not even the good clips particularly it's basically just the exposition clips and you know Mrs. Voorhees you know it's none of the good death effects of the first you know if they were going to show us something from the first why not show us the best parts instead of reminding us that the ending was you know it also does an unbelievably lame and lazy job of setting up the scare. You know, we just get, you know, Crazy Ralph and he's the only one warning them. Then we get to the camp and he tells the ghost story, which is a cool enough idea, but that's it. That's the only build-up we get to Jason and then he continues killing people. He's already killed people. Maybe I watched a slightly censored version, I don't know, but in the opening, when she got killed, stabbed with a, I don't know, looked like a, I don't know, a, a, an ice pick or something, maybe, we see something being removed from, maybe it's a kettle or something, from a hot plate and this isn't followed up on. I seriously thought that we were gonna see him 
shove her face onto that thing, or maybe see her be found with her face having melted off or something. That would have been pretty cool, but it's just that. Also, what was with the fade to white after half the death scenes in this movie? Is that some kind of code I don't know about from, you know, the early 1980s or something? That was just strange. The... It didn't make them more effective, you know? Also, what was with the moon thing and her running and running and running? It wasn't exciting. You know, I think at least half a minute, maybe a full minute passed with her just running without us even seeing Jason pursuing her. What's the point of that? And the moon thing, I'm sorry, I got to thinking of, like, James Bond, you know, with the whole circle and then he shoots. I didn't see the point in having Alice wake up and then be moved wrong way first into an ambulance at the end. I mean, that really seems like completely unnecessary. Why would you not just end it with him bursting through the window? That's what I thought they were going to do. You know, instead they just have... And I was like, are we really going to go through this again? But then they don't. They don't even have her, you know, in the hospital and... Did you find the other guy whose name even I can't remember? But no, they just have her be loaded into an ambulance. I don't know, maybe she'll be the first victim of the next one. I guess I'll find out tomorrow. Those were my thoughts on Friday the 13th, Part 2. This has been Attack of the Sequels. I hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you next time.